Hi, and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and I am so happy to have you join us today. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of storytelling, exploration, and wonder to change the world. And this Explore Classroom YouTube show connects students from around the world with our National Geographic Explorers and short lessons, and then time for your questions. Today's explorer is Dr. Susan Sang, who is a bat biologist that focuses on Southeast Asian flying foxes, one of the largest bats in the world. She has worked in Southeast Asia for over 10 years, including time in Indonesia and the Philippines. She works a lot with teams around the world to conserve bat habitats and prevent diseases and hunting from harming the flying fox populations. Susan and her teammates know that bats carry pathogens and they want to better understand how bats survive and prevent the spread of these pathogens, especially by ensuring that these bats have a safe place to live away from human impact. She hopes that after today's show, you will appreciate bats as much as she does and understand why they are so important in our world. But before we get into today's lesson, let's welcome our friends from around the globe. Today, our registered classes represent West Virginia, Wisconsin, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Ontario, Oklahoma, Ohio, New York, North Carolina, Minnesota, Michigan, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Iowa, Florida, Colorado, California, Alberta, the Philippines, North Macedonia, India, Australia, Romania, Turkey, and Ukraine. And we've got some shout outs. Good morning to Ramith, the Bigos family and Solana families, Bend, Oregon second graders, MK Lewis, Walnut Hills Elementary, Longfellow Elementary, Second Street School, Maple Grove, Simcoe, Old Mill Elementary School, Parkway Elementary, Allenby, PS97 in the Bronx, Miss Lorenzano's class at PS274, and Southeast Kelloggsville Elementary. We are so thrilled to have you and more here today. And with that, let's turn it over to Susan and get this Explorer classroom started. She's gonna tell us all about flying foxes. So Susan, take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Jennifer. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so let's, let me share my screen and make sure that everybody can see some of that. Well, give me one second. Okay. Can we all see my screen? Is there a big bat? Okay. Uh, so if you will all look around you, I, can, I also brought some friends today to help us, some bat friends. And first things first is that I know most of you are from you know, North America. And when you think of a bat, normally you think of a bat that looks maybe something like small, like the size of your hand, has leathery wings, you know, they echolocate, you know, they produce sounds that bounce back at them to tell them where an insect is, and then they go eat the insect, and they live in caves. But the bats that I study are really different. They are called flying foxes, and sometimes people call them mega bats because they're so much bigger, and they don't echolocate. Um, they don't eat insects, they eat fruits and nectar, and they're so big that sometimes their wingspans are as big as that young lady there, who is about the same size as me, actually. Um, and I have another buddy who help us with that, and he's about that big. And so if you look at your closest adult, for instance, the bats that are around here in North America are the size of about their hand, whereas the size of that bat, this flying fox, is the size of the entire forearm. So that bat is big. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big bat, but it's very friendly because all it does is want to eat fruit and drink nectar and just lick, you know, juice off of things and they're harmless, basically. But unfortunately, even though they are just these sweet little things that like to um, drink juice, they are really threatened. So there is a list um, internationally called the IUCN Red List. And where I do a lot of my work in Indonesia, a lot of them are extremely threatened. Globally, it's also about the same, but um, Indonesia has uh, a third of all of the world's flying foxes. And a majority of them are 
uh, endangered in some way, or they are just completely unknown to science. And as you see that this goes increasingly red, it's more endangered. Um, the most red part though is unknown, which is actually even worse because that means we don't have enough information to even make any judgment about them. And most of this threat is caused by some very common things that we think about when we think about uh, conservation threats like habitat conversion. So people take the forest and they uh, make them into farms. Uh, they make them into aquacultures where people grow shrimp. And also a lot of these species, because they are so large, are really big targets for hunting. So if you look at these bats, like I mentioned before, they are like the size of my forearm. In weight, that means they weigh about a kilo, which is in pounds, about two and a half pounds. And they can weigh more than that even. So people eat them as a form of meat in some places in the world. And that's not something that they have to do, but it is by choice in a lot of these cases that uh, I work on. Uh, in other places, people eat them because they falsely believe that it helps cure something like asthma, which it does not. And there are a lot of these folk beliefs that people have that lead to this harvesting of species and individuals that makes them get closer and closer to extinction because it's unsustainable. It's not something that can be maintained in the long term. Um, but now because there are more and more people, the demand for it is growing larger and larger. And so it becomes very difficult for these populations to continue to coexist with people because they're constantly being pressured by hunting and pressured by losing their homes. So what is it that we can do? Well, one of the biggest challenges with working on bats is that we don't actually know a lot about them. So what I do is study their natural history. So for instance, we know that they live very long lifespans in captivity. We know there are flying foxes that have lived up to 15 years. We've done genetic studies that show that some of these little insect bats that are in Europe and in North America can live up to 30 to 40 years. And that's really, really cool and important because that's something that helps us also understand how to make sure that we don't age as poorly also. Uh, we know that they can migrate over really, really big distances. Like they can cross oceans sometimes even, that's how far they can fly. And they do that every night just to go and feed on some fruits and come back to their roost site. And because they're traveling over these really big long distances and they're interacting with plants, they become pollinators for a lot of flowers and they become really important seed dispersers. And because they're so big, they can actually carry seeds not only by eating the fruit and then having it in their stomach and then pooping it out somewhere, but they can also carry the seeds in their mouths and just fly off somewhere. And when they're done with it, just drop it. But even though we know these things, there's so many things that we don't know about them. And it makes it uh, really difficult to make decisions about how we're going to protect them and make sure that we protect the forest and also people and other species that live in the forest when we don't know anything. So where is it that they live? So in this big wide world, uh, the bats that I study, bats are found everywhere on every single continent except for Antarctica. But the bats that I study are mostly in this part of the world, in um, the tropics in the Eastern hemisphere. So that's in uh, Southeast Asia, that's in the islands off the uh, East coast of Africa, that's in the islands in the Pacific ocean, that's in parts of Australia, um, that's in the tropical islands in Japan. Uh, but the ones that I mostly work on, like the most out of all of those are the ones that are in Southeast Asia. So the ones in Indonesia and the Philippines are where I do the most field work. And I'm gonna focus on talking about uh, my work mostly in Indonesia and the Philippines today. Uh, and I live, I live over here in the, in the East Coast of the US. Uh, sometimes I live in DC, sometimes I live in New York City. And so I have to fly uh, over and do that work. And this past year, I haven't been able to do that at all. And that's really unfortunate. So hopefully uh, all of you will enjoy this little virtual tour I'll take with you um, on my past field work so that we can all reminisce a little bit about being outside and what it's like to be, be outside. So most of my field trips start kind of like this. You know, we're just on a coast somewhere talking to some people. Somebody probably told us to go here. It's in the middle of nowhere. And oh, look, there's like an island over there. And so that island over there, that person, whoever told us, there's probably some bats there. So we're gonna go there. So what we do is we get our boat ready and we put all our stuff in the boat. And that's me and my PhD student and uh, one of our local boaters helping us pack up that boat over there and get it uh, pushed ashore so we can pack everything. And uh, here's a photo of all of us on the boat. And that the one in the front is my uh, student, my Indonesian student, Sarah. Behind her is our colleague from Indonesia and Anim, then my PhD student Lily, myself, and the boatman. And we all go on this very tiny boat. It's it's basically about as wide as only myself. And there is a motor in the back, and we go for 45 minutes out that way, and we're gonna go towards these bats. And there's this 
big site there on this island. And it looks like this swampy forest and it's called a mangrove forest. So mangrove forest is a wetland forest uh, on tropical coastlines. And a lot of the time, half of it is underwater. So you'll see in the picture there, there's all these roots from the trees that come up. And that's because those roots are from that species and they just purposely come up like claws on the, over the ground and uh, the water you know, rises and falls with the tides every single day. And so they're sometimes half underwater and they're sometimes not. And as our boats get closer, we will get to this island where we start seeing all these bats are just kind of hanging out there. And, you know, you can, you can start seeing these little specks in the sky where it could be birds, it could be bats. We know they're bats because there's so many of them. And when you look, oh, there, is it. there they are in the tree. And you'll see that there's these little tree branches that are completely stripped of the leaves. And the stripped leaves still, you know, you can still see these bats because they're just large and black. And then what happens is uh, sometimes our boats get closer and the bats will start. You can start hearing the sound. Uh, and I, I you stop the boat here so I can record this at this point. Uh, but basically you start hearing all this squeaking and it's the bats talking to each other. And the bats are telling each other like, ah, there's a boat nearby, what is going on? And so we try not to freak them out too much, but anytime you get close, that's what's gonna happen. So we kind of just let them calm down a little bit. And it's just very amazing to watch though when you're just sitting under there. Because in total at this roof site, there are about 5,000 to 10,000 bats at any given time. And when you watch a sky full of animals that are that big just come up and create like a tiny bat tornado over you, it's crazy and it's, it smells like fruit and bat poop all the time, but you know, it's, it's great. Um, it's just, it's just one of those fun places to be actually. Um, so we just watch them for some time until they calm down and then we make sure the boats are quiet so we don't disturb them and then we walk the rest of the way. So when that happens, oh, next instead. Then get a closer look at them. You'll see all of these bats are just kind of hanging out above the, the little tree leaves. And, you know, sometimes you can get a close up of them. Uh, and you can see that in their faces, you know, they're just the little dog faces I showed earlier. And they're all just chilling out and some of them are just, you know, looking at each other and just sleeping or taking a nap. Or some of them are just fighting with each other and they just, you know, flap their wings and fan because it's too hot and some of them fight and some of them switch places and that's why they're all flying all over. And so we got to the roof site. So the next thing we have to do is get inside the mangrove so that we can go and catch the bats and we can study them. So when you're in the mangrove, it's really dark um, sometimes because it's very thick, the brush is very thick. And sometimes you have to be very careful where you walk because there are branches from these roots from the trees and the tide goes in and out. So the level of the water changes. And also sometimes there's like quicksand that you have to avoid stepping into. So, you know, that's really, uh, something to be careful of when you're doing field work uh, and then we set up we set up these canopy nets so because the bats fly so high we have to actually create a net system where we put we put the net across two big bamboo poles and then we climb on top of the tree and then we tie the poles with the nets on top of the trees and then we have a pulley system that we create through the top of the net and you can kind of see the string of it here. And here's the net on the right. And here's the bamboo pole that we tied towards the top of the tree. It's very hard to take a photo when you only have one hand and the other one is holding onto a tree. So, you know, photo quality here is not as good as it can be. <laughs> um, and then when we're done, we just kind of wait under the tree. So we're very quiet and we just sit and we're very patient. Um, and there's, there's usually a three net setup that we have in a T shape. And so if they see one of the nets they, and they try to turn away, they'll still run into another one of the nets. And each one of them has a pulley, like a rope on the bottom. And every time a single bat runs into it, then we will go really, really, really fast with the rope and just pull the net down with the bat in it. Because otherwise these bats are smart enough to escape. And so we have to be very quick. So what that looks like when a bat runs into it is like this, where they are just in there and these these guys were very calm so they just kind of stayed there and they were just like oh my god what just happened but sometimes the bats will get in there and they like freak out and then they toss around a lot and we have to wait for them to calm down we can take them out of the net but this guy was really cooperative he got in the net got 
frozen kind of deer in headlights kind of look. And when he came down, he just kind of let us let him out. And he just looked at us and we looked at him and he was like, okay, so this is happening. Um, and we made friends with him, you know? So, uh, so we have a new bat friend here. And what happens is we um, put some safety gloves on and then we measure him. We give him a little nap while we do this so that he's not stressed out. And we do measurements, we take a little wing punch uh, from his wing. It doesn't hurt them, they grow them back. And we take a blood sample sometimes also. Um, and we take samples from the bag that we put them in. They sometimes poop in it and we take the poop out also. So whatever things that we can do that doesn't hurt them, take samples of that. Um, one of my other students also studies the diets of bats. And so what she does is she takes a cotton swab and she swabs all the fur for any sort of pollen from flowers. Uh, and we also do like, swabs of their mouths so that we can also test for things like herpes virus and other types of viruses that are in their saliva. And, you know, we take whatever samples we can and then we let them go. Um, and sometimes as I work at museums, we instead we process them for a museum uh, voucher specimen. But for the most part, we let them go. And that's my colleague Sigit there. I've been working with him for 12 years at least now um, in Indonesia. And we just kind of do that until we finish processing all the bats that we capture, which in one day is not actually that many, despite how many bats are flying above us, because they are very, very smart. And so they know how to avoid the net. And because it's such a, a labor intensive job, it, it takes a while sometimes to catch a single one. But, you know, you know, all of that work is so that we can study their evolution. We can get samples of the bats um, so we can actually process their DNA and we bring it back to the lab to do that. But the reason for that is because a lot of the stuff that we want to understand about the uh, evolution and the ecology of the bat is related to these factors that people are interested in in studying disease and also for conservation. So myself, my background as a conservation biologist means that I wanna study these bats so that we can learn about what does it eat? Where does it live? What is it closely related to? And that way I can give that information to these other scientists who study these other circles related to the pathogens, for instance, like what does this virus do? How fast does this virus replicate and reproduce? Um, and then somebody else who studies this virus can also say like, well, what kinds of conditions makes it so this virus is better at attacking the host and makes it so that they can replicate more? And all those types of questions, I cooperate with people who also work in you know, slightly different fields that can use the information that I know about the host, like, how old is this? What population is it from? What species is it? What species is it closely related to? How old is it? Um, what is the reproductive status? And all these other things are related to the bat itself because not everybody can know everything. So we all specialize in our little different parts and we work together in order to answer these questions. And I have a lot of information also about the environment because I'm the one who went out there and also collected that data. And we bring all this together so that we can make sure that people and bats can coexist together. Um, and it becomes a process where it, requires that there are lots of teams of different scientists that do this work. And so I always wanna make sure that people understand that in order to actually do any sort of study of conservation or disease ecology, they need to understand the evolution of the bats first. So a healthy bat population is really, really important to if we wanna have fewer public health issues. And that's mostly because of the fact that most of these actual issues we're seeing right now with um, the, spillover of viruses from wildlife to humans is because people are going into the environment, into these natural environments, and they're disturbing it, and they're stressing them out. And the one, you know, think about it, when you get stressed, you also get sick much more easily. And it's the same thing that's happening to these wild animals. And so when that happens, then the likelihood of them causing you to be sick becomes much higher, because they're also, you know, sneezing or doing other things, or you can actions that can spread the virus and normally we wouldn't be interacting with them right so i it, it's a very specialized field which makes it very difficult sometimes for people to see how they can help bat scientists but i actually think that something that uh, normal people can do is help convince one other person to not be afraid of bats because no one is receptive to listening to me tell them about why bats are actually really important to their public health and studying bats unless they are going to actually like or at least appreciate the bat well enough to not be like, oh, a bat, oh my God. You know, like it, they have to have a positive feeling to even want to hear any sort of message and facts about bats. So if you go out there and convince just one other person that bats are really cool and people shouldn't be afraid of them, then that really helps me as a scientist with what I do, because then when I tell them something, then people go, oh, that's really neat. And I'm going to remember that. And I'm going to help protect bats also. So 
Uh, I just want to open it to any questions that people have, because usually the questions are more interesting than what I have to say, and I, you know, and happy to answer whatever. And you can contact me um, however way, however which way you want to for the features also. Susan, thank you so much. And I am with you. I did not know all these facts about flying foxes, and I think that they are such amazing creatures. And I bet those of you watching with us today agree. So we'd be happy to join your mission and just tell people how amazing flying foxes and bats are. Well, friends, it's time for your questions. Susan is eager to hear them. So if you are with us on YouTube, begin to type them into the chat bar if you haven't already. And for those of you on screen with us, <clears throat> get your voices ready, me, me, me. We'll call on you when it's your turn. So we're gonna start with one of our on-screen guests. We've got a classroom coming in from Pennsylvania, Mrs. Morgan's third grade class. Um, Mrs. Morgan, who will be asking your question today? Um, I would like to call on Briley, but she's actually not able to get on the meeting. So um, she told me her question. So I'm gonna say it for her. And her question is, why are bats called flying foxes? Where they so get that from? So if the last picture that I showed and some of the ones before, you'll see their faces look very much like dogs. And so the bats that I study look like dogs. And so people call them flying foxes. Not all bats are called flying foxes, just the ones that I happen to study. Is there are over 1,400 species of bats in the world uh, and more are still being described every single day by myself and my colleagues. And we have all sorts of different faces on them. You know, some of them, look like puppies, some of them look like little mice, some of them have like little nose leaves, and some of them have squishy faces that are really wrinkly, and you know, only a mother can love kind of face also. So like it, it varies from the very cute to the cute for only certain people kind of thing, you know? So <laughs> it, there's so many species of them that there's at least one that everybody will like. Um, but the group that I happen to study is just these 65 species where they all kind of look like dogs and have the same kind of like doggy kind of face and are of different colors. And, you know, so people have just took to calling them flying foxes because they're also just very big. We've got a YouTuber asking a question. Um, let's see, Mikhail says, I know they eat fruit, but is there ever a chance they could bite a person? So with any wild animal, there's always a chance that something can bite you if you're not careful. Uh, these bats just, eat fruit. I've never been bitten because I've been trained in how to handle a bat. I do not suggest that normal people just go out and handle bats, but that's also true of any wild animal in my opinion, because there are occasions where you do not know the health status of a wild animal and you want to be careful. And so if you ever encounter a wild animal, even if it's hurt, um, I, what I suggest you do is actually call an adult and they can call a professional to help with taking care of that. Because usually if there's something wrong with the animal, you don't want to like move it in a way where it hurts them anymore also. Uh, and I have obviously been doing this for over 10 years. So I, even though that happens, I still wear gloves just in case, uh, just for personal safety reasons. And it's also safer for the bats because sometimes what can happen is people have diseases that can go to wildlife and they get the wildlife sick. And so we don't want that to happen, right? Uh, and that's something that we see in the bats in North America right now, for instance. So in the caves in North America right now, there were a lot of insect bats that used to be there, but because people brought this kind of fungus from the caves in Europe that were not something that the bats here evolved with. All the bats here got hurt by the fungus and there's uh, been a 98 to 99% um, crash in the populations of some of these bats. So that's millions and millions and millions of bats in the United States uh, that have now um, died from this fungus. And that's because people brought this virus, uh, this fungus over. So sometimes it's also for the safety of the wildlife that we wanna be careful and uh, wear protective gear and that you wanna be trained and be careful on how you also approach them. We're gonna to go to one of our on-screen guests named Eli. Eli, go ahead and turn on your microphone. Oh, Eli might need some time. So, there oh, go. there we go, hi. Why are they threatened? So I mentioned two of the reasons. So one of them is that they're losing their homes, right? People are converting the forest into a farm or they're converting it into uh, aquaculture where people grow shrimp. But the other part is also because 
they are being hunted. So people will go out and they hunt them for food or for sport, or uh, some people believe that they have medicinal qualities to them, which they don't, um, but people hunt them. And it, it's hunted at a rate that these bats can't reproduce fast enough to replace. And it, you know, it's sustainable in any way. So bats reproduce very, very slowly. Every single year, a bat, a bat mom will only have one pup and that's it. And so that's one cycle of reproduction. And that only happens once a year, maybe twice for some of the tropical species. But that means that that means the mom can only have one pup. And there's very high levels of parental care that these bat mothers will give to their children. And so they can't just like have one and then wait a couple months and then have another. This is, they just don't have the ability to do that. Because what happens is once they give birth to a pup, the pup clings onto the mother. And so this mom is literally carrying her child and flying everywhere with it for like, a year basically, <laughs> you know, and that's, it's, think about how big your mom is and think about if you had to hold on to her for an entire year, that's what she's doing. And she's flying too. So like, this is not exactly the most like energy, you know, easy thing to do, right? So this is something that the bats spend a lot of time and energy into. So they can't keep up with this rate of hunting. And a lot of these species that I work on, that's a really big issue. The other part though, is that a lot of them live on these really tiny islands. And because of things like climate change, the sea levels are rising. And so the sea levels rising means that they're losing their homes in these mangroves. And like I mentioned before, these mangroves are coastal kind of mangroves. They're forests that are on the coast of islands in the tropical areas. And so when the water rises globally and the sea levels are not only rising, but they're warming, it changes the habitat that those trees can be in. And so there's less and less places for them to live also. So it's not just from habitat loss that's directly from cutting down the forest, but it's also habitat loss in the long term because of climate change. So there's a lot of reasons like that that are contributing to it. There's also reasons like, you know, people are cutting down forests where their food is. So for instance, the Australian brush fires that happened last year for a very, very long time, a lot of the forests that were burned there are forests that feed the bats that live there. And so the bats that died there were from starvation because they lost all the forests where they can find food. And so um, in Australia last year, you see in the news that there were these massive die-offs where people will see just piles of bats in their backyards under the trees that have died from starvation and they just dropped straight down from the tree. So there have been a lot of things that are pressuring them right now. And it's something that they can't keep up with and they can't recover from so quickly. And so they need our help in order to try and at least sustain themselves until some change in how we approach our way with the environment and how we approach coexisting with the rest of the planet, you know, occurs. We're going to go to another one of our on-screen guests. We have another classroom. Welcome Mrs. Lucas's kindergarten and first grade class. And Mrs. Lucas, who wants to ask your question? I believe Abraham has a question. Um, how do the bats get diseases? So the way that diseases happen is if there is a virus or a microbe or a bacteria that it evolves in some way where it can hurt the animal that it goes onto, right? That's what happens to people also. And that can just mutate in nature in a way that it can harm them or they can get them from something else. And normally when we're talking about how the diseases that we're worried about now, it's usually something already occurs in nature from somewhere else. And then it comes into contact with these bats in some unnatural setting. And then it happens to evolve in a way that can hurt this new host to that. And so now this new host can't tolerate and can't fight off this uh, virus or microbacteria, this pathogen that can harm them. And so it becomes something that now the bat has to be like, oh, I have to, my immune system has to somehow try to fight this off. But then their immune system can't figure it out because they haven't had millions of years to figure it out like they did in the other animal that it originally came from. And so now the bat is going to get sick from it, right? So that's kind of what happens to people also, right? These viruses and bacteria, they all actually already exist around us, but in like safe forms. But in whatever con condition we're in now, those uh, viruses, those bacteria can, can come in contact with people. And when they come in contact with people in certain conditions, it might have evolved in the way where suddenly it can actually harm us. And because of that, you know, it suddenly becomes a disease. It causes symptoms, you know, like you can sneeze or have a fever or something like that. And so it becomes a disease. And so that's the same thing that happens to the bats. Basically that it's something that they haven't evolved with for millions of years. And because of that, it means that they don't have 
the ability in their immune system to just fight it off in the same way. We're gonna go to another one of our on-screen guests. We've got Adithi here with us today. Adithi, turn on your microphone and ask your question. How far back do my do they travel long distance? Yeah, so the longest distance that a flying fox has been reported to fly was uh, something like 450 kilometers. I don't remember how to think of that in American terms. Uh, it's basically flying from Malaysia to uh, Indonesia. So it crosses an entire country basically in one night. Um, and, and that's very, very far. Um, but they also like can average about 50 kilometers a night if we we're thinking about most bats. So that's about it's 50 kilometers in American measurements. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, it's quite far because what you're doing is crossing a real like ocean, like part of an ocean basically. And so you're normally not gonna fly that much. It's like an hour, hour and a half, maybe on a plane, right? It's quite far. And an, an animal being able to do that in several hours is really, really fast. And it's really, really far. Because normally most animals will just stay kind of in their home area because they're all kind of lazy. I mean, like, it's kind of like people, it's like the closer you can be to just go get dinner, like the easier it is, the better. So they just kind of do the same thing. And with a lot of um, wildlife, if they know that there's a safe sort of source of food where they can get lots of food, they're just gonna always go there. And so if that's the closest place that they know, they're going to go there. And right now um, they have to go farther and farther and that actually causes them to waste a lot of energy, which is also what causes them to become more stressed out. And then they can more easily do things like get sick, right? So before when they didn't have to do this, sometimes you know they could do it and they didn't do it, but now they can do it and they have to do it because they have no other choice. So apparently a lot of our YouTube viewers want to know, what do you call a group of flying foxes? So the big group of them, when I see them up there, that's called a colony. And that's usually what you would call a large group like that. Not all flying foxes live in large colonies, but most of the ones that are well studied do live in colonies because they're easier to find. There are a lot of species that only live as single bats, like single individuals, or they live in like a mating pair for part of the year. And those are really, really difficult to find. <laughs> um, those are the ones where if I find them, it's like literally by luck <laughs> because it means that we just happen to put the net in the right place and they just happen to run into it. It's very, very hard to do because the landscape is very big and obviously they're very big bats. So sometimes even when we catch them, they manage to escape before we can check the net for them. So uh, a lot of the ones that when you look at these big groups, they're always called colonies because they're in groups of over like a hundred. And if you're going to talk about bats, like um, the smaller insect bats also, you should usually call the colony also. So if you go to Texas, like Bracken Cave, there's a colony of bats there that you can see. And you can like uh, look on YouTube for videos of it. And there's also like a little millions of bats that create like a little bat tornado that come out. And people have video of that too. It's really cool. We also got some math checking from our producer. So around 50 kilometers is about 31 miles. So those bats are flying around 31. They're flying, yeah, they're flying really far. <laughs> like, wow. I don't even yeah. drive that far for a good dinner. Yeah, that, it's, I mean, it, it's basically going, going a pretty good distance just to eat dinner for one night and then coming back home, right? And they're doing that every single night at least twice because they have to go there and they stay around their feet and they come back towards dawn. So, and, you know, that's about like 7 p.m. at night-ish, they usually leave and then they get back at about like 5 a.m.-ish in the morning. Um, and usually when we're out there catching, it's um, as they're coming back is what we usually try to do. Because then we're not disturbing them while they're at the roost when we set up because they're smart enough to then see it. Uh, and we just wait for them to come back because they don't know to expect it. But, and they're also full. And so we don't like feel bad about it. But if we have to capture them when they're leaving, what we normally do is we also have like a, like a bottle of like mango nectar or some sort of fruit juice. And we like pour little bits of it into a tiny cup. And so after we're done, you know, taking their measurements and taking a little sample, we just kind of give them a little cup of fruit juice and let them kind of lick it. And when they're happy and good to go, we just kind of put them on the tree branch and they can feel free to fly away whenever they want to. Um, though there have been some occasions also where like we, we don't have a tree branch. And so we take the bat in our hand and basically like we had to hold the bat and we're just like, come on, let's go, let's go. And we try to like 
give them a little momentum to see if they'll open their wings to fly off it takes them a couple minutes to be like oh i have to leave now this was free food this is great so yeah they're they're very they're very chill usually when we deal with them (laughs) well susan thank you so much for being with us today friends i just want to restate the mission she has given us tell someone today about how cool flying foxes are. And I know that a lot of you are interested in supporting the work that Susan does. You can check out more about her and other explorers that we support by going to natgeoed.org. So I hope that you will check out our website. And Susan, thank you so much for being with us today and teaching us so much about flying foxes. Yeah, thank you for having me again. And hopefully all of you learned a little bit something new about bats. And I'm happy to answer any other questions anybody has. And my bat friends say bye also. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Friends, next time we'll be right here, same day of the week, same time. And we'll be with another amazing National Geographic Explorer. Though as a reminder, on May 31st, which is Memorial Day here in the United States, we will not be having an Explorer Classroom event. Remember, you can view our schedule and register your family or your class, even get featured on screen like several classrooms and kids were today. Go to natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom. And happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We encourage all of you to take some time this month to learn about Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage. And we want to say thank you to all of those who identify as such and bring such joy and excellence to our communities, including many of our National Geographic explorers. And then finally, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone celebrating. I hope you have a good close to your celebration this week. Have a great day, everyone. Stay curious, keep exploring. And if you're on screen with us, can you turn on your microphone and give Susan a huge thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.